It is Restorative Practices, part one for our SEL Forum tonight. So thanks for joining us again. It's going to be a, an overview of restorative practices. Uh, and so we'll have a part two next month where we'll really get into the restorative discipline piece. But we're going to really set the stage uh, in this presentation today. Just that we've been on enough, probably enough Zoom logistics. Um, so, you know, want to take some notes. We're not going to have a lot of breakouts. They seem to take up a lot of time, but um, it is a forum. So we want you asking questions. CJ, she'll introduce herself in a second, but she's going to be in uh, in here monitoring the chat. And um, we'll pause this if we need to, you know, answer a question. And we, we want to make sure that people are participating and um, being able to ask questions. And, and we'll ask for some questions and some participation as we go. So... Hi, right. Don, you want to introduce yourself? Okay, so I'm Donna Trujillo. I'm Vice President of Tiered Services and Special Populations. I've been with GSN for a little over four years now. Prior to that, I was Director of All 90 Schools for Special Education in Douglas County. I have been a private and public school administrator as well as a teacher for special education and grades K through 12. So lots of experience and happy to have you here. Hi, everybody. I'm uh, Zach Kess. I'm a senior director with the uh, Generation Schools Network. I've been with, I've been contracting them with a while and now about a year on uh, as full time and um, have been in uh, education a while. I started out as a, at, a, at a correctional facility for, for young males and uh, as a special education science teacher. And then spent most of my time in middle schools. So I was a middle school science teacher and administrator, and then moved up to the district level to be a director of health, wellness, and prevention. So I'm really a prevention guy. I've been doing restorative practices for over 10 years and um, loving it and helping a lot of schools and districts implement it school wide and uh, go through all the bumps with that implementation. So I've got a lot of good lessons learned. I'll share a lot of the mistakes I've made for you. So <laughs> you don't make them. Go ahead, CJ. Hi, everyone. I'm CJ Roberts. I'm a director at Generation Schools Network. I also run our Empowering Education Curriculum, which is our social emotional learning curriculum. Um, and yeah, I'm just happy to be here. I'll be running the chat and just trying to keep up with everyone. <laughs> All right, there's our agenda for the day. Um, like I said, this is an intro. So we're going to talk about why it's important, why I think and why we think restorative practices is, is a good practice, a good thing to do. Uh, we'll talk about some of the foundational tenets like social discipline, window, fair process. These are things that really are the foundational pieces of restorative practice and you need to have an understanding of uh, before you really dig in the restorative discipline. So um, this at the at the end, it says restorative discipline. We're going to get into it a little bit, but that's we're really going to dig into that in part two. Um, one of the lessons learned and the mistakes that I made was trying to implement restorative discipline and that part of it before really establishing uh, the mindsets and the structures in the school and um, just the positive proactive work that I think is way more important than the actual restorative discipline piece. So um, that's why that's why we tackle this. We only got an hour and a half with you. So we're going to try to try to do that as much as possible and and hopefully get get all of you on that same page of like, OK, I can do this proactive stuff um, and that's going to lead really well into the discipline piece. All right. So the why. Um, there's a lot of data out there. And I think some things to remember when we talk about the why. And I love uh, Simon Sinek's work of getting to the why, that golden circle, right? But these are some of the things that I've learned uh, throughout my process of delivering this professional development and coaching schools and doing it myself in schools, um, that how we present this work really matters. Um, our values matter. And so some of this, I hope that you might see a value shift a little bit, um, maybe. Um, metaphors, we'll try to use some metaphors and examples to try to get uh, get a clearer picture of what restorative practices is. I understand that I am not you, so I am not your audience, my audience right now. I am very passionate about restorative practices. I've been doing it for a long time, so I know I can come across as like up on my high horse and, you know, I'm, you know, so you guys feel free to knock me off my pedestal. My wife does it regularly. It's, it's okay. I'm used to it. Um, but I got to understand that like a lot of you might be new into this. And, and so I, I do know that. Just know that my passion and everything coming through Donna's passion, CJ's passion, because we've been doing this. We believe in it. This is our work, right? Facts do matter. Um, that's what we know from the research. So we'll be giving you some facts around some of this stuff. 
But we also know that correcting misunderstandings does not correct misunderstandings. Uh, there's a lot of research out there about myth best busting. Myth busting doesn't work. It just reinforces the myth, unfortunately. It's sort of counterintuitive, but that's just what the research says. So you won't see a lot of that from us. Um, and we, you won't see a lot of crisis messaging because that leads to crisis fatigue, right? You, if you don't do restorative practices, you're going to die, right? That's just not going to work. Um, so we'll try to keep it strength-based, positive. And again, this first part of this, this first uh, session of this, it is, it is about being proactive and, being, and using restorative practices with a preventative mindset. Okay, so some of the good data you, we have here, um, some of the stuff that, I, you know, when I was going through this and some of the research that really resonated with me, when we look at restorative practices, we really know um, that it promotes so many protective factors for our youth. Um, and so if you look at it, it really goes through all the different levels. It, it, it is about building community. So now you have the community level proactive factors. It is about building relationships and valuing, valuing relationships over rules, right? So it's very relational based. Um, and then on those individual levels, those are all, you know, right there, you can see some good social emotional learning skills. Restorative practices is social emotional learning. You'll also see, we'll talk about it. It is trauma informed. Um, and so all these, I think when we look at trying to make um, these, these impacts that we want here at the end uh, for our kids, restorative practices really helps. Um, and not again, not the, just the discipline, but some of the structures we can use um, you know, at the, at, the, at the proactive piece of this, we can really make, I think, really make an impact. One of my biggest, uh, you know, I don't know what, this is profound to me. I went to a whole different thing around mental health prevention work. And I saw Dr. Thomas Joyner. He was presenting about his theory of suicide. And we, at the time in Douglas County, when I was doing this, we, we had a rash of, of youth suicides. And so it was really a hot topic. It was very, very hard for everybody. We were going through some stuff. Um, I was also on the crisis team. And so I was doing a lot of counseling for these schools around this. This really resonated with me, what he, what, what Dr. Joyner said. And he, he's, he, his research is saying there's three kind of main things around youth suicide. Now the capacity, the, the capability for suicide, that is in his, uh, in his research is a kind of a genetic point of proponent. It's, it's what first responders, military members, a lot of people have just genetically not the same maybe fear of death or dying um, that others do, right? And so they're able to run into the burning building. They're able to go on the battlefield. They're able to do these kind of things, right? So I'm not talking about that because that's that's it. But the other two were huge to me. And I was like, oh my gosh, if I could just take one of these out of the equation, right? Then I'm doing good. I'm doing something good. And I started thinking of restorative practices. Like, are you kidding me? Look at this. Belong thwarted belongingness and perceived burdensomeness restorative practices gets rid of both of those, right? When we build relationships and we do that work to help every kid, no matter who they are, what they identify or how they identify or anything that we make them feel like they belong, then boom, that one's out of there. And okay, kids, everyone, we all mess up. If I can create structures to where I make a mistake or I whatever happens, but I don't perceive it like I'm a burden to my community, to my class, to my school, to my family, right? Then I take that one out of the equation and restorative practices in my mind can do both of those. And hopefully you'll, you'll see what I'm, I mean by that. But so this was, this was a profound piece of, of, of research that, that I connected with when, when I, when I went through it, it really is about learning, right? And restorative practices. If you look at this, this is, um, this is really good work from uh, the, I'm sorry, my thing is blocking it, from the Turnaround for Children. And I've used this for a long time, but it really is looking at that foundational work before we get into the higher blooms taxonomy, right? Um, there's, <laughs> there's a lot that needs to happen at that foundational base. A lot of this is social emotional learning for sure, but it is also restorative practices. So I think, I think, Again, when I think of proactive prevention work and restorative practices, I'm looking at building that foundational stuff so learning can happen, okay? Okay, student autonomy is another big one for me. Um, the author went to a, th uh, a presentation by this author, Dr. Strixred, and this is, was his quote. And what he said was the, the biggest determinant that they found in his research of student mental health 
is student autonomy. Restorative practices create structures, creates um, a community in the classroom where there is student autonomy, where they feel like they are in control. They are valued. They have a sense of that autonomy in, in repairing anything that's not that happened, any harm or conflict, um, being proactive and being a part and building their community like that, that is autonomy. Um, and it, it goes through all these bullet points, but I think that's what restorative practices does, right? It offers help from everybody. It's, it's very much articulates who's responsible for what. Um, it puts the work in the actual kids. If the, if the student was the harmer, it puts it in their, in their court. It's, it's asking them to take control and, and do the work, not, not adults owning the conflict, but the ones who caused the conflict and harm to actually own it and have some responsibility. Um, we're asking good questions. We were, it's about problem solving and solutions. It's not about punishment and retribution. It's not, you know, eye for an eye kind of stuff. That's not, that's, that's not what we're talking about with restorative work. Um, and so it really helps with that, that part of student autonomy. And again, you know, you got a kiddo that's, making mistakes and maybe they make a bunch of them. I don't know, but that's hard on a kid. I, and it's hard on it. I get it's hard on a classroom. It's hard on families, it's, but it's also hard on, on the, on the kiddo. And so giving some of the autonomy can help with the mental stress of just that piece of it. Right. All right. I think you're doing this one. Are you on this one, Donna? Yep. Take so our Colorado discipline study for schools, obviously, oh, I think there's another one to. Oh, put. wait. There we go. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. So we're talking also about fell safety, felt safety, which means adult SEL, your own well being. Are you taking care of yourself? Do you understand mindfulness practices, calming activities that you can utilize for yourself and then also teach your students? So A, B, C, D, E, belonging, building those relationships with your students, knowing if they have trauma in the, their background, if they're sick that day, if they didn't eat breakfast in the morning, anything about establishing those relationships can help you in understanding when a behavior occurs, possibly why, and also what type of response to take. That collaboration, SEL, value, agency, you're not in this alone. Use others to help you collaborate with your students. Collaborate with their parents as much as possible. Don't feel like you are alone. The more we isolate ourselves, just like it said in that study that Zach's talked about with suicide, the more isolated a person feels, the less they're going to be integrated into the community. So working together to build that collaboration the de-escalation, brain state dependent, respond, don't react. Meaning we as adults feel our emotions arise. We may get anxious. We may get upset when a behavior occurs and start lashing out and saying things that we don't really mean. So what we need to do is keep ourselves calm and respond and meet the student at their level where they're at, even if that means giving them time and space to be able to then have a conversation, but it doesn't help us blowing, continuing to blow it up or yelling at them or reacting negatively when they are struggling. And then that environment, make sure you pre-plan. Like Zach said, a lot of the strategy for restorative practices is not about when the discipline happens. It's about establishing things prior to disciplinary action or prior to a behavior occurring. So physical space, is there a place for students to calm themselves? Are there tools, activities? Have you taught them skills? And do you have resources for them, right? A student may need a puzzle or a book or some quiet music to listen to. Do you have things like that in your environment already for them to ask access? And have you taught them to access that? If not, you can start with a simple space where they can go quietly and calm themselves and then build from there. Now we're on the Colorado Discipline Study. So June 2022, they, this study reported a significant inverse relationship between suspensions and academic achievement. 
and a positive and a significant positive association between suspensions and dropouts. So essentially, what does that mean? The more students are suspended, the more likely they are to have lower achievement, lower grades, more likely to drop out, and also more likely for that continuous disciplinary problem or involvement with you. And this means all means all. We're not talking about incarceration. We're not talking about using suspensions as the only method for punishing a student. It's not about punishment. It's about working together to break schools equitable and inclusive. We all make mistakes. How bad the mistake is depends, but also we have to think about what are some ways that we can support students so that we don't have them going into that school to prison pipeline. And once they're in there, it's very hard for them to get out. You can see in Colorado, we have over 57,000 students incarcerated. And as they become incarcerated, their likelihood of graduating from high school or becoming successful members of society decreases significantly. Also, there is, as you can see, a disparity between race or relation to race as to how many are imprisoned over the course of their life, lifetime based on their race. And if, so we want to really be cognizant of yeah. what we're doing to students. And go ahead, Zach. I just wanted to share a quick story with you all. I mean, this is, I mean, these are national numbers on, on that side, but just, you know, we, we do a lot of work with some rural districts. And I, I mean, when I think of restorative practices, it's just, this is the way you do things. And so then it's equitable, right? There's not the, the like, oh, well, for these this group of students, I'll do this. I, I work with a school district where in the last two years, they, and it's small, it's a small school district, but they had, um, they had uh, five, five expulsions uh, for the same offense. And they were all students of color. And then as soon as a student that wasn't of color got the same offense, the superintendent stepped in to try to make sure that that student wasn't, wasn't expelled. So these things are happening across the country. That's my just my one example, right? And so if if we have a, if we adopt this way of doing things, like we just do it with restorative practices, then that stuff. Now you have to make sure you're doing that with equity because there's all kinds of papers out there about how that doesn't always work. Um, but I think if you set a cl climate and culture around this, then everyone's getting what they need, right? And it and it it's those kind of unfortunate situations don't happen because that's that's really kind of disheartening when you hear about that. Right. And Zach, we have a request to go back to the Colorado slide. Oh, yes. Boom. There you go. And did you have a question on this slide? Or do you just want to see it again? And it's also in the presentation. We, we dropped the link at the start of the forum. So you can open up the presentation, download it, save it, whatever you want, print it to review later. And th yes, they are fascinating stats. Yeah. And there's a lot of them. There's th these are each state probably has something very similar. I obviously we're we're out of Colorado. So I, we we took these. But yeah. Come on. There we go. There. Boom. All right. All right. We're, go ahead. We're gonna, Zach. Yeah, we're going to get into some of these um, just some of the foundational tenants so we can build build some of that that work. To me, um, one of the, the most important things that we, we can talk about, like I said before, is, is, our manu our, is our mindset, right? And knowing ourselves, what, how, what is it about our educational experience, our upbringing, our genetics, our trauma background? There, there are things that impact all of us. And so when we're in a situation, um, we respond or we react a certain way. We expect certain things. If you grow up in being disciplined a certain way, then I understand that's where your mindset is. If you went through schooling, when I went through schooling, then, you know, I remember my senior year, I was a naughty senior and my principal actually threatened me to swap me or give me two days suspension. I was like, dude, I'm 18. So I'll see you in a couple of days. Like we still have these structures out here, right out there. So, um, it's important to just kind of figure out where you're at with that. And when you start thinking about restorative practices, especially if you're just new on this journey, just kind of honor where you're at. I hope where we get is we have, we, we have growth mindsets and we're not a fixed mindset because 
this work does take a growth mindset. It, re it really does because we are challenging cultural norms. We are, we are challenging um, uh, things that we've established in education as what we do, right? I had another, one, another <laughs> principal tell me, well, you know, Zach, in our school, you throw, you go. And I'm like, how's that working, right? Like, I understand that's where you're coming from, but but did you know how come, why that start, that fight even started? No, I didn't, I didn't ask. Well, how do you know it wasn't a bully situation and someone was different? I mean, there were so many things, but if you have this, like, no, this is what we do. It's hard to do restorative practices. That's, that's what all I'm saying. So be aware of your bias in the scripts and the things that you tell yourself, why you perceive, why you react to things that you do, your experience matters, all these things. So I hope, and I don't, I know I'm not going to do this in an hour and a half, but as you take this journey of restorative practices and you dig in, that you might see that your that your mindset might grow a little bit in some of this thinking about traditional discipline and some of these traditional practices, right? You might look at your policies and go, "Whoa, that, that's an interesting discipline policy we got going on there," right? Right, and and or you might be like, "Well, that's how it worked for me," and then, and that's that's what I believe in, and that's okay too. Um, just understand, you're, there's definitely going to be some friction. Um, when, when you talk about re restorative practices, um, but that to me, that's really about, it, it's really about a, a growth mindset and being able to be like, okay, I understand where I was at. I, I can look at things more and I can investigate more and then see where I end up. And I just think that's important along uh, your, your journey. And I, I didn't have that understanding. I, you know, I, I, I introduced this into my middle school of 1100 kids and 75 staff. And I was like, we're going to do this. And that was a big mistake, right? I did. And also when you're doing it, <laughs> you need to be flexible through restorative practices too, right? It's not just about changing your current policies to fit restorative practices. It's about that growth mindset always. Right on. Nice point, Don. <laughs> All right. I love this. Uh, there's a lot of ways out there um, that talk about kind of what is this, the, the, I call it the heart of restorative practices. You've seen some people that have done this might've seen the five R's of restorative practices. Um, I've seen a lot of different things. I, I came up with it. I like thinking of it. I'm, I'm kind of a, like a big picture guy. So I really started thinking about what really is the foundational heart of restorative practices. And I came up with these four things and I'll kind of explain them to you, to you. Hopefully they make sense, but to me, it's, First, and it's about creating this belonging that everybody, adults and kids, feel accepted in this community, right? Restorative practices is very community based, right? It really is trying to like create this community where I don't want to cause harm, I don't want to cause conflict because this is the place I feel good, right? Like think of your own communities you you're a part of a Bible study, a soccer team, a I don't know your Friday afternoon club, like. You don't want to come up in there and start swearing at people and calling them names because you're going to get your butt kicked out, right? <laughs> like you, you, you go in there with like, all of a sudden you found this extra energy to be nice and you're, you're, you're doing that, right? Because this is the community that you want to stay a part of and you value the people. That's what we're doing. That's what we're trying to create in our classrooms and our schools and our districts. And so in order to do that, I have to feel like whoever I am, I belong. I don't want to be judged. I don't want, I like, I need to, I need to have that. Right. And, and when I feel belonging, then I feel like I have, um, there's, I've been given dignity. The reason I veered away from the, the, when the five R's talk about respect, which I, I do think is important, but to me, dignity is a different level, right? Because respect is earned. I'll, I'll hear a lot of a lot of people in, in my in my talks and and PD will say, well, those the students have to respect me, and I'm like, just cause, just cause you're an adult, so they have to respect you. And I said, what about a kiddo that's been has adverse childhood experiences, and all the adults in his or her life has failed them, abused them, neglected them, and all of a sudden, just because they walk into this classroom, they're going to respect you for being an adult when that's not their experience, right? So. We have to, as adults, earn re the respect of our kids. And, and, and so I believe it is earned. And I believe student, everybody earns respect. But there is something that goes beyond respect, and that is dignity. We all have self-worth and value. I don't care if you're a little butthead, little Johnny, that little son of a gun. That little guy still has self-worth and value, and they need to know that. 
right? Their behavior may be crap, but as a person, as a little guy, they are awesome, right? They're important. And you, we got to work on that. I think as a say culture, we need to work on that, but everybody deserves self-worth and value. We got to have be held accountable. Accountability is key. Restorative practice is not, oh my God, now I'm a myth busting. I'm sorry, I'm myth busting. And I don't want to reinforce this. It is not circling it up and singing kumbaya. Like that is not restorative practices. It truly is about accountability. And sometimes it's hard. Sometimes that accountability is rough, man. But that's what it's about. And that's where we're getting to. Punishment is easy. I suspend a kid. I could suspend a kid in two minutes. Right? Come on. Bye. See you in three days. I don't know how that's going to fix my problem, but whatever. I mean, my I whatever. I felt good at the time. I don't know. I have to re like look at myself in my my early days of that, right? When I was that early first year dean of students. But accountability takes work, but man, I'll tell you, that's where we get the behavior change, right? We know that we have to fix it. There are consequences. We have good consequences and bad consequences, right? Study for the test. Your consequence might be you did well on the test. Don't study the test. And like I tell my daughter, keep watching your TikToks and your consequence probably is not going to be something you like on the end uh, for that test, right? But once we can repair and have accountability, then we get to this place of making that community whole again. Remember, it's back to the community. When harm and conflict happened, we broke in the community. Relationships, trust, all those really hard things have been hurt. And I got to do the work to repair those and bring people back into my community. And once we do that, we make us whole again. And now we are back to this this whole community. And now it just keeps going, right? Because now it's a whole community. Now I'm, I feel like I belong and there's dignity and I'm held. Like it just keeps working, right? That to me is the heart of responsibility. I mean, heart of restorative practice. And we can do this without me teaching any strategies. Like if we just, I think, I swear, if we just like think of these things, consciously think about them, we can do that in our classrooms, our, our, our communities, our schools. Um, but that's, that's big work for, I think, anyway. Um, you're up, Donna. So our social discipline window, this is one of my favorite things. I learned it from Zach. So um, he, I love to present this part because we know that people are more cooperative and productive and more likely to make those positive changes when people do things with them rather than to them, for them, or not at all. So with that restore the social discipline window, Zach, do we have the next slide? Yep. There you go. Sorry. Okay. I want you to take a moment and think about the most impactful person in your life. Was it your grandmother, your grandfather, a teacher, a parent? It doesn't need to be positive impact. It can be negative impact. Who impacted you the most? Okay, get a picture of them in their in your mind. And now think about their actions. Did they do things to you? Were they punitive, authoritarian? Were they not with you at all, neglectful or irresponsible? Were they doing things for you, everything for you, not letting you do things on your own? Or they were they walking with you side by side? Were they restorative, authoritative, yet caring? gave you the belonging, that sense of dignity and self-worth. Real quick pop in the chat, what that person was, where they were at in the social discipline window for you. And it's, it's a continuum, right? We're not always there. Donna and I are always, uh -huh. I wish I was in the with box. I, I, I hope there's a student out there who's like, oh yeah, that Mr. Hess, like he, he was there with me in the with box, right? He was on that continuum of support where he supported, he gave me everything I needed, encouragement, nurture when I needed it, all those great things. And oh, by the way, he also held me to some high expectations. Like he wasn't putting up with crap and he was making sure that I was performing. Like I- So Hel Helga, did, Helga has a question. So yeah. Helga, hold some, think about the person who had the greatest impact on your life. That, the, that person usually pops in your mind right? Did they, someone who helped guide you or help hurt you even, but they impacted you in a positive and negative way that you can never forget. Get that person in your mind. 
And then think about how they supported you. Were they doing things to you, meaning they were punitive, very authoritarian? Kind of think of like a military drill sergeant for this one. Were they not with you? Were they neglectful? Like I had kids when I was a teacher whose parents went grocery shopping and bought ground burger, threw it on the counter, and that's what they ate. That was neglectful. Um, or they just completely ignored situations that are that when a student came to them and said, I need help, ignored it. Or were they doing things for you? Meaning permissive, like they wouldn't let you take a step. They just did it for you. They just said, oh, that's hard. Like Zach said, you got to push kids to work a little hard. Were they, but were they taking that opportunity away? Or were they with you? Meaning... They walked alongside you. They still made you do the hard work. You messed up. They worked through it with you, taught you how to take accountability for your actions, learn from your mistakes, and be able to move forward together, keeping that relationship intact. So in the chat box, think of that person and put who, what they did. Were they too with neglect? <laughs> Helga said she was a, a drill sergeant. Jessica said punitive authoritarian. Oh, she was in the army. <laughs> Yo, I was in the army too. With Zach, who comes to mind for you and why? Um, I, I'm going on the positive side and I, I can just, I can think of a, of a, a guy, one of my science teachers, my, my uh, freshman year actually in high school that really was like, got me in into science. And, and I think that's one of the reasons that's what I wanted to major in. And, and eventually I taught, but yeah, he just, he really expected us to do really well and he was fun, you know, but, but he had those high expectations and then, and provided the supports. Like you, you know, it just, it didn't feel like a college course in high school where he just lectured. He actually, you know, worked with us and uh, gave us what we needed to get, to get, get the grades and, and understand the content. So that was really cool. Yep. And so when we're walking with our students, when we're walking with other colleagues, when we're walking with our families, we want to stay, try to stay in that with window. And like Zach said before, sometimes something triggers us and we move into one of the others, but we want to spend as much time in that with window as possible. And so how do we stay in the with box? That's yes. a great question. Um, fair process. <laughs> fair process is uh, one of the way, one, it's a simple process. Um, and, and this kind of gives you some of that definition really quick. Um, but it really is about staying in that with box, right? Really doing things together, meaning I'm holding you to high expectations, but I'm giving you the support. We're working together. I, I'm finding out what you need and, and I'm giving you that what you need. Um, and it really does. It, it creates that community, the belonging, that inc inclusive culture, right? It's just, I think it, it's a great way. So, so what do we, how do we do this? Three simple ways. Um, really about engagement. And when we talk about engagement, I mean, authentic engagement. We, we've all been part of processes or part of <laughs> groups or work groups where they ask us our opinion on something, but it really didn't do anything. It really didn't matter. I was like, why are you even asking? I mean, authentic, really authentically engaging in people on what they think about what's going to, what's going to happen. I mean, in a classroom of kids, like how do you best learn? And then incorporating things. I, I really like this, Mr. Hess. I like this, you know, and then trying to trying to include that. That's authentic engagement, mm -hmm. right? And then once you've engaged them and you've gotten good opinions and you've, you know, you, you've got some good data there uh, from your staff, from your students about whatever it is you're, you're, you're implementing, um, then you have to have a, this. This next part is really important because if you're like me, like you think your idea is the best, right? And then they don't pick your idea and you're like, what the heck? Mine was the best idea, right? And then you never hear anything else about it. And they just went this weird direction. You're like, did they even listen to me? Um, the explanation part is key is like, hey, I valued everybody's input, but we're going in this direction. And this is why. It's really important. We have these things in place, these constraints, blah, blah, blah. But we're going to go, but thank you. I did hear what you had to say. But this is what we're doing now. I can swallow that a lot easier. That you're not you're not going in the direction I wanted to. I didn't know those other pieces, and now I understand why we're moving in this in this in this direction. Um, and then, like we all need very clear expectations. What what do you need from me now? For going in this direction, I need these this done, and this is clearly articulated. It's not ambiguous. One of the things we said about felt safety, right? Kids that were impacted by trauma 
an adverse childhood experience is one of the things they need that felt safety to feel safe. One of them is predictability. It's huge. And restorative practices does that. Because I am having clear expectations of what we're doing, clear expectations around how I build community, clear expectations when I engage in this process, right? So I know what I, I know what is expected of me. And that is huge for keeping behaviors down, right? And, and creating that buy-in teamwork, right? And it also doesn't feel like there's the, the, the us and them type of thing, the, the, you know, the pecking order, like they're the favorites or that. No, everybody understands what we have to do. It equals the playing field. So we get a lot of less of those social dynamics that can really disrupt behaviors and disrupt the classroom for sure. So engagement, explanation, and expectations. Quick and easy. That's how we stay in the width box. Okay. What it is not, that is also important, I think, to, um, to talk about because it, it isn't a democracy. I'm not have, I'm still remembering that with box. It said authoritative, not authoritarian, but you're still the adult in the classroom, right? You're still the authority. So it's not like I'm Hey, all right, kids, let's see. It's, it's, you know, it's math time, but let's vote. Should we go out for extra recess or do math, right? Like that's not what I'm saying. We'll never get anything done. It's not a democracy. You're still the authority, right? It's not about building consent. No, not everyone is going to get be on board with the, the decisions being made. It's impossible, right? Especially if you're a school leader or district leader or something like that, you're, you're never going to get everybody on board. But when you are explaining and setting clear expectations, it sure helps, right? And we're not about eliminating disagreement. I'm glad there's disagreement. We need conflict and it, you know, it helps us grow. So those are the things fair process is not. And just so we're not confused and thinking that it is something it's not. Okay, Donna. All right. So I've been having lots of conversations with schools and families that I work with and I who I'm an advocate for about their schools having restorative practices, but their children with disabilities or gifted abilities are really struggling with the process. So we think, Zach and I thought it was important to remind you that inclusivity, equity, uh, once again, does not mean one size fits all. And the way to encourage this and make sure that you're taking care of students is be aware of the strengths and deficiencies in the social cognition and social skills. So for example, a student who has autism may not be aware of those social cues that are happening and not pick up on those. So when you're doing a circle, you may need to spend some time ahead of time, preparing that student for what's happening. And at the end of it, talking to them and talking about their perception. Did they hear things correctly? Ask them, so tell me what you heard. Tell me what you're thinking. Just ask an open-ended question and make sure they heard it correctly. And if they are struggling with the process, you may need to go to tier two, tier three supports. They may need social stories some skill development. You also want to consider cultural background. I had students when I was a teacher who were of Native American descent, who had escaped the reservation. And when I was teaching them, found out that they were in special education only because they refused to make eye contact with their teachers or talk back. Well, if I had to talk to our other teachers about the cultural differences because not looking someone in the eyes and also not talking back to your elders is a sign of respect in that culture. Turned out they were gifted. They weren't students with disabilities, but have been, because no one considered their cultural background had been labeled as such. Think about your language proficiency. Translation, sometimes translation, does not go the way that it was meant to. Things can be translated incorrectly. And so then a student walks away, a parent walks away, a teacher walks away with a completely different picture of something. So make sure that when you are translating, you're not just pulling somebody in off the street or the secretary who knows a little bit of Spanish or a little bit of Korean, but that you actually have professional interpreters who are trained in the education terminology and also with your sign language interpreters as well. Also consider your accommodations for students 
when you're doing circles, when you're having conversations, think about those students with vision impairments, hearing impairments, what are they going to need for support so that it brings that equity and access. Also, students may not be able to join the circle. Some of them may not feel comfortable. It may cause anxiety, make them feel anxious. So maybe they have to sit outside the circle, but they can still listen and visit or connect with another student outside of the circle. Again, like I said before, follow up with your students. Use your act affective questions to access, assess their understanding. Don't say, did you understand what happened? And they say yes or no. But really, tell me more about what happened, or can you share with me your thoughts? Those open-ended questions are very important. Rely, like that ABCDE, collaboration. Collaborate with your special service providers, whether it's a gifted and talented coordinator, special education providers, psychologist, counselor, get tips. Also, Share with them when you see struggles with students or something feels off so that they can work on it. They can adjust those plans. They can adjust the goals. It also helps them gather data of what to go, where to go next. Also, especially for our students with disabilities, make sure that you communicate with their parents if you did do a circle, because I cannot tell you how many of my clients call me upset because so-and-so, they said that they got in trouble today and, and this happened and this happened. When I go back to the teacher and talk to them, something completely different happened. And the parent never needed to be upset if the teacher had just emailed and said, hey, we had a little uh, incident on the playground today and so-and-so accidentally hit so-and-so with their jacket. So we talked about it as a class. Done. You don't then end up with 20 calls or emails that night from all these parents wondering, why did you get, what happened? So-and-so was bullying with so-and-so and they strangled him with the coat. Let them hear, hear it from the horse's mouth, right? And then also as you're leading circles or talking with students, take notes for you to look back on. Zach, when we were planning this, you shared with me how, what you do with your notes. And I think it was a useful to, tool for them. Yeah, so you know, when we'll talk a little bit more in the, in the second one of these around formal conferencing or or the the discipline side of the things, but I always had my um, notes ready, the, the 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 format already out and ready to go, um, so I could stay on track, stay on task, watch my time. But I always use that as my notes because, um, and I'll, we'll go over this a little bit. But as a circle keeper, you're not you're not doing um, in the conflict piece of it. You're not doing all the talking, right? You're allowing the group to talk. And so it's just smart to take notes right on that. And that's what I would do. And I would, I would leave spaces on my, um, on my agenda that, that I would make my script. And then I would just write notes on what people said. So I could reference them back and I could, I could talk intelligently about what someone said and reference back to that one when, when we're trying to come up with a solution. So that's just a strategy you can use. All right. So this, um, Circles is something that I, we hear a lot about and, and, and probably very synonymous with restorative practice. If someone says restorative practices, most people are like, oh, you do circle. It's circles. Um, I hope what you're hearing so far is that it's a lot more than circles. And there's a lot of this proactive things that we can do. But yes, um, circles are a very effective strategy. Um, they give you some structure. They give you good strategies to use when doing restorative practice. I'm going to give you, we're going to go over it pretty quick. I mean, I, when I was trained, it was like three days of circles. You're like, oh my goodness. So we're going to go over some of the basics with circles, um, but they can be super effective. They've been done by indigenous peoples around the world for eons, right? It started because they had a, a circle with, a, with you know, a campfire in the middle and they had to watch each other's back. So I always will talk about that with students or new groups. It's like we're a community, we're in circle, we got each other's backs. And that's what we're at, what that's about. It, it's, a, it's a symbol of equity right? Like no one is in charge. No one is like set outside. We're all in the circle. Um, and there, it's an opportunity to inc include everybody, make sure they feel like they belong and make sure everyone has voice. Some of the, um, some of the different parts of the circle um, or first is that circle keeper. Like I said, that usually starting out is usually the adult. 
I hope you get to a place where students start to do this. It's really cool when you get a, a student in your class go, hey, you know, miss, mister, can we like circle it up and RJ this? You know, they'll use some of that terminology. It's so cool. But usually we're talking the adult, right? And it is as the circle keeper, you're guiding the participants. You're maintaining a safe space, right? You'll see, I'll give you a template on, on how to run a circle, but there's norms and expectations. Your job as the circle keeper is that we're, we're adhering to those expectations so that above all, this is a safe place. We're not letting things get out of hand and crazy, right? And we're staying on time, right? If you're a classroom teacher, right? You don't have two hours to run a circle. So stay, keep the time going, keep things moving. Um, and that that is your job. Um, sometimes I'll, I'll notice that the teacher or the administrator might do a staff circle and then they won't be in the circle. It is our community, not my community, or not just your community, right? So you're in the circle with everybody. So make sure you're engaging too. If you give an example, like oh, I want everyone give me an example of how you're feeling today, do that also, right? Um, a talking piece. I am not a purist when it comes to restorative practices and circles. You can read some books. There's a lot out there. And some of them are like, you will absolutely have a talking piece. You know, I think you, you know your community and if it fits, it fits. It can be a very useful to tool for sure. Um, it, it, it helps make sure there's a equality in, how, in who's talking, right? Um, and sometimes you have the little oversharers, the ones that want to share all the time. And there's strategies for that too. Um, I use, I've used popsicle sticks before, like everyone gets three. And once you share, you put it in the middle or crumpled up paper and there's a weight, you know, and then there's a weight, uh, like a garbage can in the middle and they shoot it. Like once you're out, you're done. So if you have some of that, you know, as you're starting to establish those norms and expectations, you might have to use some of those tricks of the trade, probably similar to most teachers using their classroom whenever kids are sharing. And we have to, you know, watch the over the one that wants to share all the time. Um, but it's, it's really about their responsibility to listen. It's not that I have the floor, but if I have the talking piece, it signals that everybody has a responsibility to listen. We're teaching good SEL skills, good co collaboration skills around active listening and all that good stuff. Um, a centerpiece, sure. It can be super cool. You can see the picture has one. It can represent your 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 team, your your class. They're kind of cool. It's just pictures or books or artifacts that like are important to you, and, and it reminds you that when you're in circle, that we're we're all together here as, as, as you know as a as a team or as a family or was it you know whatever. So they can mean they can really pictures. Pictures are even a great way too. Students could do put their pictures of their family or someone important to them because then it makes people see them as a human outside of the classroom guidelines and expectations you got to do each you know as your classroom you got to establish those in your class what is that what is going to help people feel safe in circle right? you got to have those for sure and the circle keeper like i said it's it's that circle keeper's job to make sure that we're 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 maintaining those all right i got to speed it up a little bit don i'm a little off time but um so circles here's the thing don't do a circle your first circle when harm and conflict happen that's not when you do it, right? You should, you circles should be well established as positive community building, fun, check ins, content related, something so kids understand the safety of a circle. Because when you're dealing with harm and conflict, there's a lot more emotion, there's a lot of things, and you don't want to throw in this like all of a sudden chairs are in a circle, right? The other thing is if you only do circles when everything's bad, then when they walk in the classroom and they see the circle, they're like, ah, oh, Johnny again, that dipstick. Like, what did he do, right? So don't do that. I try to say five to one. Make sure you're doing the proactive stuff. Celebrations, talking, sharing, all that good stuff. Make sure that it's a safe space that people can share. You're going to establish those norms and expectations so people feel like they can share their thoughts and stories. And when everybody has a chance to do that, right? And it, you know, it's what goes on in circle, stays in circle, all those kind of things. Um, it really starts to become a very safe place and, and a very real special place for people and to, to share their stories and talk. Um, and like I said, the structure is important. It's, it's important not to have desks in front and barriers in front. Um, I'll tell you what, at, as a school leader, the most effective uh, staff meeting I ever had was in circle. No one was grading papers. No one had their laptops out. We sat in circle. We looked at each other. We talked about important issues, right? It's an, it's an amazing, amazing thing. All right. So this is a basic structure that you can use. I think it is important 
that you plan a circle and you just don't willy nilly do a circle. You're going to find and get frustrated because all of a sudden 30 minutes have gone by and you're like, whoa, I had to do math. Like I missed. Oh, my gosh. Right. Just like a good lesson plan. Right. And eventually, like as a seasoned teacher, you stop me. Well, most of us, I did stop writing down lesson plans for every lesson. Right. Same with the circle. Once it, once you get the, the feel of it and understand how it works, you probably don't have to do this. But this is really helpful. Number the thing you don't skip. Don't ever skip the guidelines and values. Make sure everyone knows what's happening. The discussion rounds are really the meat of it, and you're planning that out. Be very cognizant. If you have 30 kids in your classroom and you're asking them an open-ended question and you want them to share that how long that's going to take for them and do that math in your head, right? Some circles are sequential where they go in order. And some you might want to be like, hey, we're going to use the talking piece. We're going to share if you want. That saves some time, right? Because not everyone. Um, so there's a lot of other thing. There's a lot of other rules around circles. I really encourage you if you really want to get into it, there's resources online that are free. There's really great books out there that could help you just with structures and, and all kinds of good things, but at a minimum, plan them out, make sure you're ready to go. So you feel comfortable doing them. Any, any questions though, so far on, on circles or anything that anyone wants to bring up any questions so far of what we've talked about, let's, we will do a little check in here. You can come off mute or you can put it in the chat. Chat. I like the small Helga said in her, like they have a small community. Yeah, leadership team. Don't put this, that's on lesson learned. You can't be the only person implementing this or being the only champion. It does not work. It gets really frustrating. You get really burned out. I got really burned out. Um, create a team. Have support. You know, find your teacher champions and leaders that want to help with it. All right, Donna, you can start with our effective language. And it All looks right, so like we're about on time. Okay, our affective language. So when we're communicating, we want to communicate in a way that doesn't set off people's defense systems and keeps the relationship on a level where they can keep talking to you. So how do we do that? So we try to avoid putting it on negative behaviors, but... We use our personal expressions of feelings. This made me feel or what happened made me feel and the impact on to the others, others, positive or negative behavior. So, you know, when you were running down the hall, I got scared that I was going to get ran into. And also you might fall and trip and hurt yourself or another student. Then provide a non-gentle, non-judgmental observe. That was the observation, all of it. Okay, sorry, we, I'll keep going. So we want to name the person we're talking to first, make that non-judgmental observation, connect it with an I statement, and then connect it back to what you need. Keeping in mind your tone and body language. If you're revving up your voice level, even though you may not think you're yelling, that person may take it as yelling. We also don't want to talk down to them. So just keep it on the even, make sure that your body is in a calm state. And if you can't be in a calm state, pause the conversation and do it when you're able to. So, you know, Zach, today, when I saw you throw that mashed potato, that spoonful of mashed potatoes right in your friend's eye, it made me really sad because I know that's your best friend. And I don't, I, I need to know more about why you threw those mashed potatoes and what we can do to figure the problem out. So can you tell me more? Can you tell me more about what happened? Nice. Okay. Questions on that? And we do have some examples. I don't know if we have time to go through them. Yeah, you can go through. I, okay. We're right on time. We're good. All right. So if you're talking to someone in private right johnny i heard you weren't using you were saying swear words during our group work it makes me feel angry when i hear them because i worry the class won't feel safe is there something that i can help with what's going on right they're going to open up jill i noticed you weren't taking notes during class i am frustrated because it, impo it is important information for the project coming up and it's stressful for me to find time to explain things again. Can you tell me what's going on today? Or like Zach said, 
I notice you're on TikTok instead of taking your notes or studying for your test. And it makes me feel stressed because I'm not, I'm worried about you failing. Yeah, that, that part is a really good example of you're, you're bringing it back to your need not being met instead of this kind of almost blaming like Donna, mm -hmm. it's your fault. I'm frustrated, right? Mm -hmm. I'm frustrated because there's some need for me that I'm feeling frustrated, right? And it is like, I'm thinking of my schedule. I'm thinking of like, you know, wh whatever. Oh my God, the class is going to blow up. It's starting to stress me out. Like that's the need when, when I'm, I'm bringing it back to my need. I'm frustrated because that behavior but it, it's it, but the need it's the stress that I'm feeling that I might lose control and that is causing me a lot of anxiety. And name that stress because that's also modeling for the kids uh, of labeling emotions and understanding that we all have emotions and that it's okay to not be okay, but that you can work through not being okay. So, calm another common one. Sam, I noticed you were out of your seat and talking to Johnny again after I redirected re you earlier. I feel disrespected and angry when you don't follow my directions because I'm concerned others will also get distracted and I'll have to spend time getting the whole class out under control. What, what would you help, what would help you stay in your seat during your individual work time? This one I like a lot because it provides choice. You're not saying you need to stay, stay in your seat because that's the seat you're in, but you're opening up a conversation. Maybe that student has ants in their pants. Their body feels like they're a ball of energy and they need to get up and walk around the classroom or they need a wiggle seat or they just need to go get a drink of water. When you see those things, you can open up conversations and learn things that you may not have known or incorrectly assumed. So here's another example. Class today, so this is how you can teach some examples of affective statements. So class today, I wanted to, to talk to you about the unkind words and actions I've observed in the last couple of days. I've heard the statements, that's gay, nobody likes you, and you are stupid. I have also observed groups not including others. I'm very sad to see and hear these things because it hurts my heart when I think bullying may be happening. I am worried I will not get through all the content. And I need to, that I need to, if I have to shift all my gener energy to teach kindness, would anyone in the circle like to share with me what they think is going on with our class, within our classroom community? So <laughs> you're again, you're not telling them they have to be kind or not to bully each other, right? You're talking to them about the real circumstances and you're opening the door for opening up conversations about what's going on and problem solving together for them to have that accountability and ownership and for you to walk with them, not ignore it, not do it to them, not do it for them, but everybody being in this together. And that situation is a nice one. Um, just like the, the kind of the first time you're, you, you want to address this where you're not, you know, it's probably Johnny and his buddy, Tim and, you know, whatever, but it's not singling out students right because that shaming piece is never a good thing but it is allowing the class to have some voice around these things that they're hearing and talk and there is some accountability when johnny and his buddy tim are hearing what the other classes are saying like this isn't cool the teacher doesn't think this is cool right and sometimes you can nip some of those behaviors in the bud when you just have a class discussion around it and and you know what you, you'll be surprised. Johnny would be like, yeah, I, I hate hearing that kind of stuff. You know, like it, it, it really can be a very effective kind of just preliminary uh, piece into a, into a circle. For affective questions, you want to focus on the behavior, separate the deed from the doer, engage all involved, the harmed and harmer, Find solutions to make the community whole through accountability and reparation. Having those conversations, these questions help you with that. They focus on learning and skill building. And then same outcomes of affective statements. Avoid using should, why. Use could instead. And avoid, tr avoid why. Try Instead, use try or what or tell me more. When you, when you use that word should, right, you already implied that what they did was wrong. Like what yep. should you have done? Now I'm already putting that, like, 
you know, but look, what could you, what could you have done? You know, so it, and again, back to that tone and body language piece in this, that, 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 or matter. even next time, what could you do differently? Right. I, I understand the situation happened. What could you do differently next time? So for the harm, remember, there's always a harmed. There's always a harmer. Also in these situations, sometimes as you dig in, you realize that the harmed is actually the harmer who harmed the harmer. So be open-minded. Don't make assumptions, right? Dig in deeper. Yes, you can go in. Okay, I think this one was harmed. So tell, ask them to tell you what happened. How have you been affected? That gets to the emotions. What has been the hardest thing? What would need to happen to make things right? That gives you an idea of what they need for that, for other, the harmer around account accountability. And what can I do to help? Again, not assuming, well, okay, so they got hit. They're going to be okay if I just remove the other student from lunch the next day, right? They may have a different idea. They actually may feel unsafe all the time and need something more. So it's important to dig deep. And for the harmer, what happened? What were you thinking at the time, right? What were they thinking? Meaning, what were they, maybe they were feeling something. I even like adding, what were you thinking or feeling at the time? Because then you get, and they may not be able to say what they were feeling, but you know, I get, oh, miss, I was so mad and I just couldn't contain myself and I kept trying and I held it in all day, all day long. They were just pestering me, pestering me. And then you realize, oh, they were the one that was getting harmed. They were lashing out against the harmer. And then who was affected and how? That gets them outside of their box of it was it's it's hap their actions affect more than just themselves or more than just the person who they hurt. And what do you take responsibility for? This is where you can start getting that accountability. The conversations happen, you get to the heart of really what are they, where are they at? How deep do we need to go into that accountability conversation? And what can you do to make things right? Again, they may come up with some great ideas, but because you've had the conversation with the harmed, you kind of have an idea of what's going to work for them and what then the harmer might be willing to do and can start that thinking through. But if you don't talk to both parties, you can make some missteps. Strategies we gave you so far, the affective language questions, circles, um, just kind of the mindset around building community are all very effective ways for reducing the amount of disciplinary action you're going to have to do. Um, it reduces the amount of harm and conflict, right? I told you I'm a prevention guy. That's where I've done all most of my work. And so I'm all about how can I get out in front of this to like stop the behaviors and all that before, right? If I'm keeping, if I'm in the with box as the adult, Right. And I and I setting high expectations, but do, providing the support and I'm using fair process. Um, right. I'm 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 creating the inclusivity already in my classroom. I'm taking a lot of those stressors out of my classroom community or my school community where harm and conflict are going to just bubble up. Right. So I'm trying to get way out in front of this. And, and I think that's why you want to concentrate on those strategies, those things we talked about before, building the community, building relationships making sure people feel belonging before you really want to even get into the discipline piece. Um, this is where I've also learned lessons and seen where restorative practices goes wrong um, is where people jump into only doing the restorative discipline when there's not an understanding of it. Um, there's not the relationships. There's not the trust. Like, can you imagine sitting there and asking students some of those questions? And then they're like, I hate Hess. Hess is the biggest jerk I've ever known. And he thinks I'm going to answer him honestly. Right. I have to have relationship. It's important that those kids know and trust me. And I've done the work. So when I ask them, dude, what were you thinking? Right. They're like, all right, here's what I was thinking. Yes. Right. They'll be honest with you. And, and, and it just, it just opens things up. And then I'm like, what can you do to make things right? All right. Well, because they know it's not going to be, I'm going to hammer them. It's like, I'm going to hold them accountable. I think I could do this, this, and this. I was like, sounds like a great idea. Let's get started. Right. 
and they know it's authentically going to be done, authentically delivered, and, and, and that accountability is going to help them restore themselves, right? Restorative practices, like what are you restoring back to, right? If you have a crap community, a very punitive and just not, not a nice community, then, then why would I want to be restored back to that? <laughs> like, no, it's okay. Send me home. It'd be awesome. I could be there all by myself playing Xbox. I don't want to be part of your community. I don't want to be in your classroom, right? So that's why all that proactive work is so important. Um, and like I said at the beginning, when it's a place people want to be, man, you're not, you're going to, you're going to put in that ener energy and effort um, to not cause the harm and conflict. All right. So this is what we know. We know the differences um, between restorative discipline and, and traditional discipline. These are some of those things, right? The restorative discipline, again, we are involving everybody that was harmed or part of it, right? We are talking about relationships. We're talking about accountability, not punishment, um, and that they have a role in it, that the harm and the harmer are the ones solving the problems. I think as adults, we think we have to own the conflict, which I don't, I, I think is kind of, well, that's a lot. That's a lot to do. Um, but, you know, the ones that cause the harm and conflict, they should be the ones owning it right? And taking a part and really fixing it. That traditional sense of a discipline to me, it's very adult driven, right? They're dictating, we're really harping on rules. It's kind of what our society does around things right now, right? Um, it's it's how justice is is kind of delivered now. And so I, I, I understand why we're there and why we see those as examples and why we do that. Um, but I think we also concentrate so much more on the person that was that, that was the harmer, kind of like what we do in, in out there in the world um, and not really engaging with the person that was harmed. I mean, I know we have victims, advocates and all those kind of things, but but really having them have a say in what's going to happen is important. You know, the harm happened to them. The conflict happened th to them. They should be the ones figuring out and having a say on how they're going to make things right so they can come back into the community, right? Thinking about ways when you send a kid out of your classroom, what are we doing to make that kiddo feel like, you know, things are okay. I, I think sometimes adults, we feel like, oh, they just know that I don't hold grudges. No, they don't. No, kids are scared to death to come back into your classroom. They think all the kids in there hate them. They think you hate them. They go to the extremes, right? So like, what is the work we're doing to say, hey, Zach, like, I love you, man. That behavior is crap. You needed a break. I'm glad you're back here. Like, what are we going to do to keep you focused in class? Because I, I want you in this class, Right. That's huge. And that takes all of 30 seconds, right? But I think we, we skip some of that uh, in, in our just day to day. Really important before you start with discipline that you understand where you're at. And I know this is easy to say. <laughs> it's like, I know, don't take it personal. I know when a kid told me to F off in the eighth grade, man, I took it personally. All right. Um, I, I'm, you know, do as I say, not as I do. No, but really try to work on it. And I think that's why the trauma conversation is so impactful in this work is there's so much going on there. We, it probably isn't what you did. It is a culmination of things that are going on. Um, and so, yeah, they lash out. And here's the other thing is any parents out there know this, and I can tell you this from experience with my almost 15 year old daughter, I guarantee you, she does not talk to her teachers. Like she talks to me or my mom or her, or her mother hundred percent. Right. And she, I know loves us more than anything, but we're safe. I'm going to forgive her all the time, every time. Right. And so when you, have students that don't have positive relationships with adults. They don't have good relationships with their family members. And they come to this supportive and loving teacher that's in there and asking about them and they're having a bad day and they go off on you. Right. It might, it might be that reason. And I know it, it hurts. I'm not saying it doesn't, but let's try not right. Try to not take it personally and, and let's try to respond and not react to those feelings. If we're feeling that way, um, what are your strategies? right? Name it to tame it is my favorite. If I know the emotion I'm feeling, I can try to take some strategies. I can do mindful breath. I can take a break, right? Um, all these things are important. And, and then, and then trying to model, uh, you know, how, you know, how I, how I talk to students and stuff. And I know that's easier said than done, um, but it, it does go a long way in building that community. I, I put the image back up there for the heart of it, right? This is restorative discipline. It is alternative 
to exclusionary discipline. It is time in with someone, not time out. I'm not kicking them out. I don't, I, I want to communicate that they are valuable and I, and, and I can separate the deed from the doer, right? That I do, they are a valuable member, that I'm showing them dignity, that they have value and worth in my classroom or in my school. How do I do that, right? When I do restorative discipline, I am actually building protective factors. I'm having them process all these things. They're, they're digging into those hard social emotional learning school, skills, the, the, those the hard decision making and, and, and relationship skills, right? I am building things like that. I am creating opportunities to connect to more adults, positive adults, right? Some of the things that you, you'll hear and we'll go into in the, in the next, um, next session of this, impromptu conferencing. That's just seeing something happen right off the bat. And instead of reacting to like, maybe it seems like a, a unsafe situation, right? Maybe it seems like two boys fighting, but maybe they're not. Maybe they're just messing around because they're two buddies, or maybe it is a bullying situation, right? We don't know until we start to investigate and start to ask. So an impromptu is like go on there. Hey guys, guys, what's up? What's going on? Right. And you'll get a sense like, as adults, I think we, we get a sense of what's going on. You can read body language and you're going to know if this is a bigger issue or not. And if I need to see them separately and talk separately to them in private to really get to the meat of what's going on. Because if it's a bully situation, oh, it's fine. Everything's fine. Right. Like they're not going to say it in front of the kid right there. And so I might need to like, OK, this is up. But I'm telling you what, eight out of 10 times, it is just normal kid conflict. And someone pushed something or someone did, I don't even know. And you can take care of it right there. We don't have to have a referral. We don't have to go to the office. We don't have to do a lot of things. I can take care of a situation right there and just say, guys, come on now. It's a hallway. We got five minutes to get to class. Like what is going on? Okay. Uh, yeah, I understand. Like, and then you can go through those affective questions, right? And hopefully you can just nip it in the bud and it's done. Move on to class. If it's a bigger issue, you will know. And then you can take them down to the office, whatever your next level of support is. That's impromptu. That's why it's like, it's not planned, right? You're just walking down the hallway and you see two boys wrestling and you're like, whoa, 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 right? A one-on-one -on -one agreement. I love these because they are, and, and we'll go through them in the next one, but they really set the stage of being a, like a, it's a positive interaction between a kid and the adult, right? I've, I've, I've asked Donna a few times to stay in her seat, to stop talking, to stop disrupting. Um, but it's, it's now it's kind of getting to be repetitive, not, and it's, it's, it's not happening. It's not, not going the way I want. So I can now schedule something a little bit more formative. And I actually go through, it's on a piece of paper it's, and it's just asking some questions to get them to engage. It's using affective questioning, but it's doing it in a manner where I'm still communicating that I, I, I like her. I, I, I want her in my class, but that the behaviors aren't okay. And, and we go through a, a process of, of, of getting through that. And we will go through that in the next section. I'll go in more detail with, with the one-to-one -one agreement. Mediation. That is usually uh, between eh, a smaller group of people, like usually one-on-one. -on -one. It could be staff to staff. I did, I've done a lot of uh, a teacher to teacher or administrator to teacher. I've done a lot of adults. The adult drama, I'll tell you, I have a less patience for. But it is never, needless to say, there's a lot of that in, in our schools. And so, but this is such a great way to get two people to talk it out and just figure things out and then and, and move on. Um, and Zach, we have a yeah. question in the chat yeah. about... Um, what happens if the student harmed the teacher? Yeah, same. I mean, like, like how do, how does the teacher how does the teacher handle the conversation on their side, right? So they yeah. are the ones that that's harmed. My my recommendation is go through the questions, the affective questions yourself, and and write out your responses so you can get your affective questions, and then talk to the person who was the harmer ask them those questions when you're in a good space to do so and be able to tell them, well, here's what I thought. And then you guys can come to an agreement. It also teaches the student how to take accountability and that they themselves, when they get into a sticky situation or have been harmed by others can have that conversation. But if you feel totally uncomfortable, again, collaboration with another peer or an administrator or someone who's familiar with the practices. 
Absolutely. That's yeah, exactly what I was going to say. And, and, and it's not that you're ignoring the behaviors. We don't, in restorative practices, we don't ignore the behaviors. Um, it's just timing. And when we mention that on the trauma side of things, that state dependent de-escalation, if a kid, if, if a student or an adult is not in the cognitive part of their brain, they're in the triggered emotional or survival part of the brain, it's useless to ask questions, right? There's no cognition happening. The brain doesn't work like that. And so a, a student may have harmed, caused harm, went off, lost their temper, threw a chair, called you all kinds of fun names and, and walked out of the classroom. That does not mean you need, unless, now safety is a different thing, right? But that doesn't mean I have to go pursue that child down the hallway and stop them and say, you will listen. You know, like that is not going to work well. It's not, it, nothing good is going to come out of that, right? That's not when I start using affective questioning and trying to solve that problem. I'm going to do that when I'm at a regulated state and the student is a regulated state and we can address it, but we absolutely will address it. Many of those times um, I've had someone else, like Donna said, a peer that would do it or an administrator that helped facilitate that conversation where they were the one asking the questions in the mediation and going through those questions, being the neutral, as neutral as possible person in there. There, When we talk about mediation, guys, there's a lot that goes into that. And, um, you have to do some investigation between before you bring two people that that however the harm is happening, you just throw them in a room together and start asking them questions. There's so much harm that can be done in that kind of a situation when you haven't done your homework and figured out what's going on. Nothing, and Roberta, Roberta, we don't when we're meeting with them, we don't use the word you were the harmed and you were the harmer. We have these on so that you know what questions to start with. So if Zach harmed me, I would use those affective questions that have the harmed label. You wouldn't ever say to a student, I know that you were not the harmer, or I know that you were the harmer, or the one who was harmed. These are just labeled so that you know where to start. So that when you go in and meet with each student or each group of students, you you can use those questions. So if you think that one Zach was the one who was harmed, use that set of questions with Zach. And if I was a harmer, use that set of questions with me. But like we said, as you dig deeper and start asking these questions, you may have to adjust because it turns out that I was the harmed and Zach was the harmer. Yeah. And that and that's why that that pre-conference with that individual questioning with students is so important because you I can't even tell you how many times I went into a conversation with kids thinking it was one way mm -hmm. and it wasn't. And that's something really powerful. You have to come at it. And, and I always say a neutral facilitator, and I know it's hard to maintain that, but to honestly not pass judgment until you've heard it. Right. And that's, I know that's hard to do. Um, but it, I think it is so important to really get to a, gr a good place because it's going to come across when I'm asking the questions. If I can authentically just ask you like, so what happened? Tell me what, <laughs> tell me what happened. I mean, how many times, like it, it is so rare for some adult to ask a kid, like, no, tell me your perspective, man. I really want to know, like from your perspective, what happened? You want you and really tell me how you're feeling. Yeah. All those. How, how did it make you feel? And then you may not even know, you don't even have to assume that there's a harmed or harmer. You can ask those questions to get to who was the harmed and who was the harmer. And it, and it goes like, <laughs> what time is it? And I have, I mean, I've had to expel kids, right? Because of weapons. And I'll tell you one, one story that, that, that was just, I can't imagine what would have happened if we wouldn't have handled it restoratively, right? Even though it was an expulsion, we did a formal conference, which I'll get into in the next one, but we did it restoratively. And we had a young seventh grader, he brought a big knife to school and he threatened a student with it. Right. That's an auto in Colorado in our district. That is an automatic expulsion. And if I would have gone in with this, with this anger triggered, like as we can, and I'm not blaming anybody, right? Like that's what you like you. That's an easy place to go because uh, you, that is scarier than anything. Right. But if I, if I wouldn't have done this and asked questions and dug in a little bit, I wouldn't have known that this kid had been bullied by four other students, four eighth grade students at one spot in our school that we didn't have adults under a stairwell for six weeks straight, this poor kid was physically bullied 
right? Not, I'm not excusing the weapon like that. He understood that is, that is not the strategy. We, that is not okay. You know, that behavior is hundred percent not okay. And there are significant consequences for that. But you know, what was really just, just broke my heart is that none of us in that school knew that was going on. How did that kid not have a trusted adult that he could tell that that was going on? How did none, no one, no one see any of that happening. Like there are so many layers to that, that we found out. And then we were able to hold, I was able to hold accountable the other four students too. It wasn't an expulsion because I, I tr tried hard never to do those things unless I had to by statute, but they were held accountable, right? They had to be part of, of fixing that solution, right? The families were involved. It was, it was huge. It was powerful. We went through like five boxes of Kleenex, I mean, it was a beautiful restoration in our school, right? And if I wouldn't have done that, then this kid would have been labeled violent, just whatever labels you want to put on a kid that would do that. And we didn't know the whole story. Okay, that's an extreme example. But when you bring two kids into a room and don't do your homework and ask each one what was going on to figure things out, there is a risk that you are causing more harm because you haven't figured out the story yet. And I know it takes more time and people, I, I know that there's, I'll give you next time tricks of the trade to go through it as fast as you possibly can, right? 10 minutes each, done, done, done. And you go, you get through it. But, but that there is, I just can't tell you how many stories I, I've heard of when you do it that way, um, the mishaps that happen. And then people hate restorative practices because it, it, it doesn't work, right? Um, and you have a kid that was in a bully situation they didn't know and the parents complained and it was a, a big, huge power differential. And you put that kid in front of their bully and you didn't know it. And now they played, they played you and you, you it, it, uh, it gets bad, right? So you can, you can see how things can happen. So what I'm saying, that's why the pre-work in restorative practices is so important that we establish those, all that pre stuff before we just jump into the discipline piece mediation is powerful it's amazing you can do it but you got to do your homework and you got to invest in it and do do it the right way um because three I, minutes zach we, we have three minutes kids. left oh my gosh okay and then there's circles and then there's formal con conferencing we'll get into all that all right see I'll, I'll just keep going okay we're not gonna do that um here's the feedback survey what i want guys i want questions come off mute like what what things are just like I, I got to have an answer before we get to this next one. And how dare you not tell me about all these things and hold the, the, the thing over my head that you, I have to show up next time. Well, and CJ, uh, will you drop the survey link in the chat so that people can fill it out as we're taking Q and a. Yeah. And remember right if now. you, thank you. And if you fill out the survey, you give us your feedback that we do use it and we don't discount it. We use it to plan our next forums and provide support and you get your CEU certificate that way. And sorry guys, do not use this. I was just reminded, do not use this QR thing. It goes to the wrong way. Use this, use that survey. The um, link that C link. CJ just dropped. So yeah. what questions do you all have? What thoughts, ideas, anything? Do you need anything from us? When is our next one, Donna? I can't remember. I think it's November, January 9th. January, yep. I think it's it's another Tuesday. So we'll send out that link and everything. So hopefully you'll join us. We'll really dig into the discipline piece of things and start talking about how to how to do that. Um, it's January uh, 6th, nope, January 9th. Yep, okay, 9th. January 9th. Yep, January 9th, same time. And then Zach, we do have a question. Do yes. you find that if used properly in the beginning of the school year, poor behaviors decrease throughout the year? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, belonging, we know from the research, connection and belonging is the number one protective factor against all risk factors, right? Risk factors cause lots of stress in, in a kiddo's life. Lots of things going on. Overwhelm of stress causes overwhelm of emotions, which causes um, a lot of behaviors and the things that we see and the things that we get re really re frustrated with. Um, restorative practices is also a great, th that, I mean, if, if you want to fit it all in a nice little bundle, it's like, 
it's like restorative practices, SEL and trauma informed, all those together. If you, if you can use those practices and, and they overlap and a lot of them are the similar, same thing, then you're doing so much to create this environment in the, in the classroom where yes, the behaviors just, they're, they're not there. I mean, think about the first day of class. Like I've seen my teachers run circles. They circle it up the first day of class and they ask kids, how do you like to learn? Okay. That's I'm in the with box right now. I'm using the social discipline window. I'm authentically engaging them. How do you best learn? Right. What do you, what do you need? What support? Like, and I'm doing that and I'm establishing those relationships with right off the bat. Um, and so I'm acknowledging that it's okay to struggle. I'm acknowledging that it's, you know, that we all learn differently. I'm, I'm, you know, and I'm, I'm creating this, this environment where, you know, however I identify, whoever I am as a kid or whatever, that I'm going to be accepted in this community. And I, I, I'm telling you, the research is super clear, right? There, there's not going to be the amount of behaviors in those classrooms, um, in, uh, in the schools with some of that stuff. So uh, our tougher schools, I mean, our, our tougher communities, there's more, there's a lot more at play there. And I, and I know that I, we work at Generation Schools Network. We work I mean, this thing started in inner city New York, right? That's how this organization starts. So there's a lot, we, we do know that there's, there's, there's bigger factors at, at, at play and societal factors and community factors. Um, but still the research, it, and from my experience, if I feel like that's a safe place and, and they belong, right? When I worked at the correctional facility, I didn't have behavior problems in my classrooms. My priority was connecting with those guys. Right. I learned about the game. I didn't I, like, right. I don't know anything about gangs, but I went out. I was like, you guys got to tell me about these. What in the world? You're, you're a, you're a Sereno. Like, what does that mean, man? Like, I don't even know what that means. Right. Like talk to me about this culture. And so that I understand it and I can talk to you intelligently about it and with empathy and with understanding. Yep. And also remember guys, if you need help or want help with implementing restorative practices in your school, this is what GSN does. We week. get grant and funding for you all for us to be able to go out and provide the materials, training, coaching, and walk with you through the journey of implementation. So remember, Zach and I are here for any questions you have, not just now, but also here's our emails. Also, if you want to have us work with your school, your district, just please uh, reach out to us and we'll schedule a time to visit. And and another understanding. I know we're over time, guys. So please, we're just going to keep rambling. And you can you can go if you need oh, to go. Yeah, we'll we'll see you next time. I hope. But understanding this does take time and it does take work. And when you talk about school wide implementation of anything, but especially restorative practices, it's a two to four year commitment. Like you don't. Please don't just like I'm going to read this one book and I went and saw Zach and Don at this thing and we're going to do restorative practices. <laughs> Like do some, do your homework, really dig in. Um, Cause you, you want to make sure that um, you're setting it up for yourselves. That's for sure.